From Chicago, welcome to Three Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast devoted to the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing industry. I am fairly confident that there is definitely enough to carry on doing in that space, at least until I'm ready to retire, um, which is good because it keeps us in research projects. Um, one thing we're doing at the moment, we're just finishing off a study looking at um, ultraviolet aging of parts. Um, so we basically have, it's like a giant tanning bed, um, but a really high powered, you know, you wouldn't want to get in it tanning bed that we were able to take a load of parts and just put them in it for varying amounts of time. Um, and we've been able to track the color change of those parts because that's obviously quite important for a lot of applications. Also the mechanical properties. Um, we've also been using some new characterization techniques to see if we can identify the changes in things non-destructively. So rather than needing to tensile test our samples. Um, and so that's quite interesting because I think that's one of the things where if you're talking about end use parts, we need to know what happens if we take them outside. Um, and certainly <laughs> if you consider anything in the automotive sector, like that's a, a massive thing. That was Dr. Candice Majewski. Candice is a senior lecturer in mechanical engineering at the University of Sheffield with a teaching and research focus on additive manufacturing. Much of her work centers around understanding and optimizing interactions between materials and processes and added manufacturing processes involving powdered plastics. She joins the show today to talk about developments in powder-based polymer printing and the work her team does in developing new materials for industry. Well, welcome to the show, Candice. Do you want to just start with a little bit of background and how you got started in the additive manufacturing space? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me on. So I'm Candice Mayevsky. I'm an academic at the University of Sheffield in the UK. I'd say my journey to additive manufacturing was probably one of complete luck. Um, during the final half of my final year at university, that was at Loughborough University, um, we had a guest talk from someone who talked about, at the time, rapid prototyping, so before we even were really calling it 3D printing. Um, and he spoke for two hours and I was just blown away. Um, <laughs> and so that was kind of the point where I said, wow, that's what I want to get involved in. Um, luckily managed to find a master's course that was just starting in that area. So I was one of the first people to take that course, learned a lot more, figured, yep, that's exactly what I want to carry on doing. Um, luckily, again, so much of this was um, not really scripted. My supervisor for my master's project had a PhD to offer. So I was able to take that and then kind of just stuck with it from there. Fantastic. And what would you say your kind of core focus is on your research at Sheffield today? I'd say, so I'm interested in two things, I guess. One is, and this is the core focus of the research, is in particular on powdered polymer 3D printing systems. And what I'm really interested in there is looking at how the process and the material work together. So I think we've tended to talk quite a lot in the very early years of 3D printing in terms of here's a machine and now let's find a material to go in that machine. And actually what we're trying to do is understand that, that interface between the two. So how does the material behave in the machine? How does the machine affect the material? And if we can understand those bits and what's happening at a scientific level, hopefully we can start to work on materials and machines that are better designed for each other. So that's kind of the core area of research. And then something else I've become quite interested in recently is looking more into how our parts behave in what I'd say are real life scenarios. So we have quite a lot of... I say quite a lot. We have some understanding in some cases and quite a lot in others of what our parts behave like when we take them straight out of the machine, but we have much less of an idea of how they'll behave under different real life conditions or in an actual end use application. So I've got quite a lot more interested in that because I think it's the thing that is needed in order for companies to, to uptake the technologies more. I think they need that reassurance of this is how the part will behave in our specific application rather than just this is how it did behave when we first made it. Right. And as I was preparing for this conversation, I was thinking back to kind of my early days when, when I was first met you at, at Loughborough and I'm pretty sure you were 
the one that gave me the introduction to the EOS P110 back in the day. So my very first actual laser centering build, you were there helping me walk, yep. walk through I'm, it. I'm and, even going to correct you on that because it was the P100 at oh, the time. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> so we're like even well behind that. <laughs> yeah, I remember that actually. It was, that was always a fun thing was showing people how to use the machine. And then I seem to remember actually that first set of stuff we did worked really well and that we were very confused because we hadn't really planned what to do next. Um, Cause I think we were expecting to take a few days to play with the material and get it to work. And then suddenly it worked and we kind of stood and scratched our heads for a minute and said, well, what <laughs> now we should come up with a plan for what to do next. That's right. That's right. And so even thinking back to that and kind of your focus today on that materials and machine interaction, how important do you think it is to have that experience in front of the machines as you're either developing materials or working on new machines? It seems like that interface of actually getting your hands dirty, working on kind of the nuances of, of production part, production equipment and, and the 3D printers themselves, is it, it's quite challenging to understand if you don't have some of that at least firsthand experience at some point in your career. Yeah, I definitely, well, I'd agree to an extent. Um, I think the, when I think of companies that we've worked with, by far the most successful ones have been when someone has been kind of been up for that, right? Like, can I come over, see the machine? Can I experience what happens, you know, from start to finish of the process? So how do you prepare the powder and then what happens to it in the machine? And then what do you do after you've finished? And you know, what bits can we change and what bits can't we change in terms of the parameter space and that. Um, and so I think actually, if I was to look back, I've noticed that it is, it is those companies that are, tend to get it quicker maybe. Um, so I was quite, I listened to the talk that you did with Bill Heiss, I think quite early on in this series. Um, and we worked with Eastman on some, some powdered polymer stuff, as you know, because I think you made the first introductions there for us. Um, and that was the thing that grabbed me with them was they wanted to really understand every detail. And so there were lots of questions and they were standing in front of the machine and saying, like, what's happening now? Why do we see this thing that happens? Why do we see this other thing that happens? Why has that not happened now? And so I think it's being able to get that experience is really good or at least being able to engage with people that can try to tell you that stuff. Um, I've certainly spoken to people who definitely have the opinion they can just turn up with a material and we stick it in the machine and it will work. And then you kind of backtrack a few steps and you say, well, look, the first thing we need to do is see whether it works. And then we need to figure out why it doesn't work if it doesn't work. And then we need to work on making it better. And I think as some of that as well probably comes from experience of putting stuff in the machine and it just fails catastrophically. Right. And at least my observation in, in the industry has been as it's matured slash grown or evolved over the last decade, there is more and more companies at least taking a look at it and, and trying to understand how does it impact our business? Is it a threat? Is it an opportunity? And both on the machine equipment manufacturer side, but as well as materials companies, um, looking for new applications or new markets for something that they may have just been making injection molding pe pellets or something like that. So when when you're approached by materials companies, how did those convers how have those conversations evolved over the last number of years? Are they getting more acclimated with technology as well? Are they thinking about new applications or new markets? I'd say it's probably a mix. So I think some people. Um, some people are kind of saying, well, we've seen that our competitors are getting into this space. And if they're getting into it, that probably means we should be thinking about it. So I do see a bit of, I'd say, companies trying to play catch up a little bit. So, you know, thinking, actually, we maybe could have started looking at this a couple of years ago and, and maybe wanting like the fast track how quickly can we learn some stuff in this? Um, for some companies, I think they're already quite savvy and they've done quite a bit of research on you know, all the different 3D printing processes and markets. And they're coming and saying, actually, we see a market for this particular material for this particular application. And so we'd like to investigate that. Um, 
I think most companies, you mentioned it just then, most companies at the moment are still at the stage of saying, we've got this injection molding grade, or we've got lots of injection molding grades we'd like to have a look at. Let's get them in a powder form and stick them in a machine and then see what happens. Um, so I think we're, from what I'm seeing, we're fairly far off people wanting to develop formulations just for these processes, which kind of makes sense if you're a big company and you have thousands of different polymer grades in the first place you know, why wouldn't you look at some of those first and, and see how far you can get? So, uh, so that's where I'd say we're at with, with certainly the companies that I speak to is let's try what we've currently got. Let's learn from that. And then if we can identify a big enough market and a formulation that works, maybe we can then adapt it from there. Right. And, and that ba- balance is probably pretty tricky in the sense that, laser sintering or any of the a lot of the powder based polymer processes have pretty strict thermal requirements or just general material requirements that i would say limit all the formulations that you could do you have to look at melt point and the sintering region and a lot of different aspects of can you get into a polymer powder and, and things like that how do you kind of manage some of those kind of variables and screening um, challenges well, when you're talking to people about new markets and, and new resins I think some of that's quite interesting because actually the thing the thing that sometimes is the most difficult thing actually is getting that polymer into a suitable powder form in the first place um, and I've certainly had um, experiences through other companies where they've been trying to get the material ground into a certain, you know, certain size distribution, roughly the right sort of shape, whatever, and just keep coming back with, we still can't get it right. And so actually that need for, if you imagine the powder surface and you want your powder to be nicely packed in quite a dense layer, that sort of thing is, is for me, always the first stumbling block. So it's kind of, well, first of all, you need to get us a powder that's going to flow nicely in the machine, deposit nicely, give us this nice dense area. And kind of once we've got that, <clears throat> then we can move on to the sintering step. But I think sometimes we forget about that first step, which is if we don't get a nice, even dense layer of powder in the first place, we're always going to struggle to overcome that. So actually that that stage, which most of the time is still, you know, taking injection molding pellets, for example, and grinding them into a powder, that's still so variable and there's so much inconsistency in that, that I think that's one of the things that's giving us the biggest issues. And so you kind of say, well, actually, when I, when I stick some energy into that and I start melting it, it looks like it behaves quite nicely, but we just need to get it to that nice, even layer in the first place. And so that's quite a big challenge, I think, is having that consistency in the powder itself. Whereas actually, I think you know, the injection molding grades of things, the pellets people are supplying, they've spent lots and lots of years honing that and getting everything right. And so now we're kind of trying to apply that to a, a different area with much greater requirements on it. Right. And you have to think about things like yield and even mm-hmm. if you can grind it, how much sieving and screening do you have to do to get it to a distribution that makes sense exactly for the process well and i think the other thing with that is that sometimes it's just it can be very time consuming as well so you're quite right if you you know ground some stuff down you're trying to sieve out all the biggest bits let's say but then if what you're left with is a tenth of what you started with as very few people are going to say that's a good yield from that material um and it's also something someone explained to me years ago, it made perfect sense. Um, and they said, well, how much powder do you want? And I kind of said, well, you know, if you could get us like 20 or 30 kilograms, that would be enough for us to start doing some, you know, a decent amount of testing on this material. Um, and the person was saying, I won't name names, obviously, in terms of companies, but the person said, well, to be honest, if we want to do like half a kilogram to a kilogram, we can do that quite manually and that's fine and we can just do it as soon as you talk to the the bigger levels like the 20 30 kilogram amounts he said basically we have to move to our big processing plant and at that point we might as well make you two tons of the stuff and so there's an interesting point there where the amount of material that we need 
to perform some useful trials in one of the machines and actually get a quite comprehensive idea of how the material's behaving is in that kind of whatever the opposite of a sweet spot is, like the, <laughs> the spot of death for the, the quantities of material because it's not something you can sit and easily make manually but it's also way smaller than the companies are used to making. And so that's a bit of an issue for us as well in, in trying, to, trying to manage that. Absolutely. And I'm guessing with, with that, it, there's a whole I mean, science behind grinding and, and mixing and, and even adding flow aids. When do you add flow aids to, to a powder to to get it to flow when you're, you're sieving it that come into play as well. And I mean, I guess uh, I'm kind of question along the same lines is that in, in the kind of laser centering space, even MJF high speed centering space, it's still mostly nylons, nylon 11, nylon Mm -hmm. 12s. Generally, most of those materials are not ground. They're precipitated or produced in, some sort of chemical reaction approach. And, and so do you see that as a big difference as well, that you're kind of looking at like the gold standard for working in a, a process is, is coming from a completely different kind of powder making approach than some of the grinding approaches that, that some of the new entrants are, are trying to, to take on? Yeah, definitely. And I think the trouble is the precipitation approach is always going to be more expensive um, and perhaps a more complicated approach. And that's not to say people won't do it, but I think you'd need a great deal if you're a material manufacturer, you'd need a great deal of confidence that that material was good before you'd start trying to go down other manufacturing routes. And so there's almost this chicken and egg situation sometimes, which is, if we knew this was going to be really good and we knew there'd be a big market for it, we'd invest the time and the energy and the money into doing it. But until we've got something that we can test, then we don't know whether it's going to be good. And see, you kind of get into this circular argument sometimes, which is "Mm, if we're 99% certain that this will be really good, then we can take that higher up the chain and, you know, through all the levels of sign off on it. Um, so something we're trying to do at the moment, which just before COVID-19 hit, we were working on, um, is developing basically a desktop system that we can use for trials in the hopes that we'd be able to do that sort of thing a lot easier and a lot quicker with companies. Um, so, you know, maybe at the level where something you could produce in the lab quite manually is can be done in enough quantities to actually, you know, if we could get two tensile test specimens out of it, test them, see how the material's behaving in the machine and everything, then at least that gives us a starting point. But yeah, I think the being able to get the quantities in the right form and consistently in the right form is definitely a, an issue with that. Um, and as you say, the, the standard commercial materials, you know, they come out, I think we used to always say they were very spherical. They come out very potato shaped, so quite smooth and and fairly symmetrical and actually when you grind some of the injection molding polymers from other companies what you end up with is is basically cornflakes so there's a (laughs) a big difference there Um, one thing we're doing that's quite interesting though is we've got a phd student adam who's um, co-supervised between me and our statistics people at the university and so he's looking at how you can bring a statistical approach to those things and say okay, if we couldn't change anything in the the size and shape and morphology of the material, are there other things we could do to kind of make up for that? So, you know, could we still get around those issues if we had a material that had, you know, a, a different melt viscosity or a material that was less susceptible to temperature changes or whatever it might be? And so I'm hopeful that's going to be that sort of thing of being able to say, if we set something as a fixed parameter, so we say, okay, we have to put up with this cornflake shape because that's the only way we can actually generate some material to start with. What else might we be able to do or what else might we be able to look at to see whether we can still get some good quality parts out of it? Right. And that's certainly super value for it, a super valuable 
piece for, for industry where, I mean, if you have a new machine or are looking at entering or expanding your 3D printing capabilities, either from an end user or, manuf- or a material manufacturer, there aren't that many places where you can just experiment and have the depth of knowledge that you guys do in terms of seeing a lot of different materials, trying to get them to work and, and the timing it takes just to, to try and get some good parameters out. I mean, it, it's months easily in yeah. some cases, years to, to get some of the, those good quality data points out that you're able to confidently say, okay, this is a good material. Now let's ramp up some production and, and get through all that testing. So yeah, you guys play an extremely valuable role in the industry and in, in facilitating that well it actually so i always think of something really funny when i first started as an academic um and a company wanted to do like five days of consultancy on something related to powdered polymer centering and i had no idea what to charge for that because you know i was a new academic i was like i don't know how much we charge to do consultancy so i spoke to our consultancy people and they gave me a number which to me sounded huge and i went back to the company and said well, you know, they've kind of suggested this much, but, you know, we can we can talk about it. And the guy from the company just came straight back and said, yeah, that's fine, go for it. Um, I was quite amazed because I was like, well, that's, that's unusual. And it's the first time I'd done that. Um, and then a while later, he said something quite similar, which was it was five days of work for, for you guys because you'd got the equipment, you'd got the experience, you'd got the the practical knowledge of the machine and of how materials behave in it. So paying that, what to them was a small amount of money compared with having to spend months getting up to speed on the, the processes and the materials. And that was, that was quite an awakening for me, was realizing that it's not just actually about the, the thing that you're doing or the thing that you're testing, but it's, I guess, the opportunity cost for the company. So if they had to do it all themselves and get that expertise in-house yeah it ends up costing them a lot more um but i think it's quite nice as well for us so my favorite engagements with industry are always the ones where at some point we we're kind of finished um and that probably sounds really weird because then obviously the money stops (laughs) um but actually getting to the stage where a company can say right i think we've learned everything we need to learn about this and then they can kind of you know, if I use a parent analogy, they can fly the nest and go off and do their own thing because they've they've learned what they need to do. And actually, that's probably the most satisfying bit of being an academic working with industry is being able to say, yeah, actually, we've we've been able to educate you on those things, saved you a lot of time and heartbreak because, you know, you've now managed to learn from previous mistakes that we've made when we started. But that's that's always a nice type of collaboration, actually. Absolutely. And as you've done more and more materials development, uh, I think you mentioned early on that another focus of, of your work and research is those real life applications and, and seeing how parts perform in the field. Mm-hmm. Kind of what state of the art there? Uh, that's a, a space where, I mean, if you look at a data sheet from any of the vendors, it doesn't matter who it is, you get tensile properties and one direction maybe multiple directions yep, some basic like parameters from the dsc that anyone mm-hmm. could do and then go off and, and print it no, nothing really about parameters or long-term stability or chemical resistance anything like that so what's i th- feel like there's a lot of a lot of room for improvement in, in that I space think, yeah i i'm fairly confident that there is definitely enough to carry on doing in that space at least until I'm ready to retire, um, which is good because it keeps us in research projects. Um, One thing we're doing at the moment, we're just finishing off a study looking at um, ultraviolet aging of parts. Um, So we basically have, it's like a giant tanning bed, um, but a really high powered, you know, you wouldn't want to get in it tanning bed that we were able to take a load of parts and just put them in it for varying amounts of time. Um, and we've been able to track the color change of those parts because that's obviously quite important for a lot of applications. Also, the mechanical properties. Um, we've also been using some new characterization techniques to see if we can identify the changes in things non-destructively. So rather than needing to tensile test our samples. Um, and so that's quite interesting because I think that's one of the things where if you're talking about end-use parts, 
we need to know what happens if we take them outside. Um, and certainly <laughs> if you consider anything in the automotive sector, like that's a, a massive thing. Um, and are those laser centered parts or parts from a, a laser different centered, Yeah, laser centered and high speed centered at the moment. Okay. Um, just for that initial thing we're actually hopefully going to then extend that into a more detailed study so <clears throat> the machine that we've got that does the uv aging also has the ability ability to control temperature and humidity um and i've been reliably informed that with a few modifications we can also make it simulate rainfall in there which <laughs> i don't know that we need to do that bit but actually being able to build up something that somewhat simulates you know really real life situations right so over X amount of years in this climate, you'd expect to have experienced this much sunlight and this much humidity and this temperature range and, and all of that kind of thing. I think once you start to be able to understand those things, then you can give companies a lot greater confidence. And you can say, actually, you need this part to survive five years, let's say, depending on the application. You want it to survive five years. You can fairly confidently say at the end of five years, it's not going to have lost its mechanical properties or equally actually it's going to lost, lose its mechanical properties within six months. So yeah, don't go down that route. And I think sometimes knowing when not to use the 3d printing approach is probably at least as important as knowing when to use it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, I mean, a huge opportunity there in terms of like even conversations I've had with, with folks is, you get only so much from a, a tensile reading. Most mm -hmm. most of the time, it's it's a multiple multiple factors that impact. Kind of like you said, there's sunlight, and then if you have a part that's been in sunlight for six months, a year, and then you drop it, what happens in the field, mm -hmm. right? Or you impact it in a certain way if you your tensile properties as you come on the machine are cut in half or cut in a third, is that still going to pass your tests that you, you did right out of the machine? And so I think there's exactly. so few people that have thought about that. <laughs> or, I mean, not, I mean, there are people certainly thinking about it, and, but it's just the amount of rigor that's gone into that is, mm -hmm. is not easily available in I really think any literature. I think one of the reasons for that though is there's been so much to fix with these processes and you know, I always try to keep in mind and whenever I'm teaching our students I always try to say you know don't forget this is still actually a really new set of technologies so this is not stuff that's been around since you know 1600 and has gradually iterated and improved and I think because you know if I look back to thinking of all these techniques as just for prototyping the jump between prototyping and end use manufacture is massive i mean you know exponential at least and so i think first of all it was quite logical to say well look we just need to see what happens when it comes off the machine and we just need to see how we can make that better and so you kind of can't do everything at once and as we get some of that basic off the machine information out the way you know then there's space to start looking more broadly and start saying right well what do we actually need to know or understand or fix in order for it to be suitable for you know the automotive sector or or whichever industry you want to talk about but I, I guess there was so much to do early on in the very basic bits that it's not really a surprise that we haven't been looking at these bits for in so much detail right and I guess a another question I had so when you're doing the UV testing and partnering that with mechanical testing do you also look at factors of where the part has been sampled in the build and how many parts is, can you test in a build before you can reliably say that it's clear or pass, no pass? Because I think that's, I'm guessing that's also a, a, a factor depending on how big your machine is, how dense your parts are packed and all the other process related factors yeah. that you can add in. Well, and it's the sort of thing that I think people are not very used to because in certain, I mean, if you've got, if you've got a process, a more traditional manufacturing process that's been set up for years, churning out parts, you kind of, you know, that stuff instinctively. Um, but yeah, certainly for the, for this sort of testing, we're packing parts throughout the build. And then I always want to say randomly selecting them, but it's not random because we make sure it's 
properly sort of random so you know if it randomly said take all the parts from here we'd not do that but you know choosing different regions of the build to look at and see as you say what's the what's the variation in this um because i think the variation in properties is certainly one of the biggest things that's holding back so much of the 3d printing industry um and i remember talking to someone at a company and he was just saying look if i know what i'm getting and i know that that's what i'm getting every time i can work with that and you know we can design to those tolerances or those mechanical properties but he said when he can't tell from one part to another is it going to come out the same size is it going to behave the same mechanically or whatever that's when it's a problem and so that repeatability of things i think is something we're definitely going to have to do better at um, it's something that's part of we have um so epsrc is one of our funding councils and we have a future manufacturing hub in manufacture using advanced powder processes and as part of that um, powder-based 3d printing is quite a large component of it and that's one of the key things is how do we make sure that we know that what we get out is what we wanted to and without having to take a load of parts and measure them all or test them all and everything right and, and how do you also translate the information that you're getting with these advanced properties and combination of of testing to designers that who will ultimately design for the process something that doesn't look like a tensile bar with different wall thicknesses different orientations <laughs> what's how does that process work so that is i mean that's not something we've done a huge amount of yet actually because we've been focused a lot on the sure. more machine orientated things um i know there's a new design for manufacturing um network that's been set up over here which i think will be a really nice way of getting into um into that sort of thing because i think there's there's a lot of it's very important for experimentalists and material people and um and you know all of those things to really be working with the designers because i think it's it's again one of those things that if people are designing for something they don't know about then how do they how do you design for it right that's the, <laughs> the difficult thing um yeah so the team at loughborough have fairly recently received um, a uk design for additive manufacturing network um, and so i think that sort of thing is what will really help by being able to perhaps come into that sometimes and say hey here's what you need to know about mechanical properties or perhaps even some of the things that for some of us who've done a lot of experimental work that we instinctively know like i know it's going to make a difference if i position my parts in different areas of the build i know it's going to make a difference if i orientate them differently so if i build them horizontally or i build them vertically or whatever and i think even that kind of level of information saying to people you know you need to be aware of these type of things is quite important as well um and some of that you know can seem like a very low level set of information but you've got to get that low level of information across first before you can start then worrying about the the deeper and the longer term issues with it right and so at sheffield you're kind of teaching and researching in the space and talking to a lot of different audiences the industry um as well as the students can you talk a little bit about kind of the different programs different courses that integrate additive manufacturing that you're involved with mm -hmm. yeah i love teaching the students it was <laughs> genuinely one of the best bits of the job actually um and in many ways it's a very easy subject to teach at the moment because it's still relatively new it still gets quite a lot of media attention uh one of the things that's most difficult with that actually is the amount of media attention. So we spend a whole session on, we have a, a final year undergraduate and master's level module. Um, and a whole session of that I devote to talking about how to understand the, the truth underneath all the hype about it. Um, you know, and you see something in the press or, or whatever, and how do you, figure out what's actually going on with that because i think some of the stuff about you know different processes and you know the benefits the limitations of 3d printing and all of that is quite easy to 
to get across and to summarize. But the difficult bit is how do you teach someone to read an article and know whether it's fake really... news or not fake news? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's exactly that. Um, and so I think, you know, it's things like my, my biggest complaint, and all my students know this, and so they quite regularly send me emails titled, this is going to really upset you, followed by a, an overhyped <laughs> bit of uh, information. But it's things like, um, we talk about sometimes the example of, you know, is this the world's first 3D printed car? And no, it's not. It's a 3D printed not very structurally sound shell of a car and then everything else has been made using traditional techniques and it's i think that sort of thing becomes a bit it needs to be managed because then you get people who are genuinely thinking right we're 3d printing cars now and if you think about what that implies in terms of repeatability and structural integrity and you know fatigue life and all of those things it implies that we're quite a lot further advanced in some of these techniques or in any of these techniques than we really are. And so, so there's quite a bit of work to do actually with that in terms of, okay, read the article, but then get to what's the underneath or the underlying bits of that. And, you know, yeah, what you've done with this bit is great, but actually, no, we're not there in terms of making these other things. Um, yeah, so I have to <laughs> I have to restrain myself sometimes from going on a bit of a rant about that. But I think it is there is a lot of misinformation out there, and so all I really want for our students when they come out is to be able to make informed decisions and judgments about things. So, you know, what do I need to consider in terms of processes? Do I understand that each process and material combination will give me something different? So, how do I look at that and? figure out what I should be using? How do I figure out whether I should use 3D printing for this application in the first place? Um, and then kind of moving on with it in terms of what do you then do with that information in terms of things like post-processing and that kind of thing. So once you've made your part on the machine, what do you need to do with it after that? And so kind of just really trying to give them an idea of the whole process of 3D printing and the things that you really need to be looking out for. And I think if everyone goes away with that level of information, that's kind of, we know we've done our job. Right. And as we wrap up, if there are any companies or even potential students listening that want to learn more about kind of the programs that are ongoing or contract research or um, government research going on at, at Sheffield, can you give just a, a short uh, pointer of where where they should look or some interesting initiatives that you guys have going on? Yeah, so I think for students, I mean, if you go to our um, web pages, so sheffield.ac.uk, if you search for the mechanical engineering course information, um, you'll find out information there on our different mechanical engineering courses, and that's where our additive manufacturing teaching sits. Um, we tend to offer... The taught module, we also have bits of 3D printing that feature in some of the earlier years of our program. And then our, so each of our students does an individual research project in their final year. And so for that, you can again tailor that towards a, a 3D printing type of project. And that's, I think, where some of our students really get the, the most benefit of being able to bring all that knowledge together, bring it together with some other bits that they know from different areas of engineering, tie it all together into one nice package and actually we tend to do we tend to put in projects that will have you know actual applicability so whether it's we want to know this about how our machines behave so that we can learn to to make them better whether it's actually we've got this new material that we'd like to have a go with so you know you do some testing on that so quite a few opportunities there for for getting a bit more hands-on with it um, and then in terms of companies, I mean, really, we try to be as flexible as possible with how we work. What I would normally recommend to a company that's just wanting to kind of scope things out or test the water is to do it via a short term bit of consultancy. And that's quite nice because it allows it allows both sides to kind of get to know each other and figure out what each other's motivations are and that kind of thing. Um, also gives us a chance to say, actually, what you're trying to do, you probably can't do at the moment, <laughs> uh, which again sounds weird in terms of turning away money, but actually to say, yeah, the, the 
processes or the materials are just not there yet for the thing you're trying to do. You know, keep an eye on it, give it a year, five years, whatever it might be, and then look at it again. Um, and it also allows in some cases just to um, do what we were talking about at the beginning. You know, maybe you come over for a couple of days, COVID-19 not permitting, um, but you know, maybe you come over and you just have a look at the machines and we talk you through some general stuff and we show you some machines running and you can start to get that kind of understanding. Um, so that's often a good way to kind of start a relationship. And then we're always looking for things like, um, you know, PhD projects, you know, government funded projects, quite often we would have project partners on. So as the relationship develops, those are things we can do. We also have some programs in the university that will match fund research. So actually to allow those relationships to start forming. Um, so yeah, I, th I think the short answer is whether it's a, a quick dabble for a few days just to kind of try things out or whether it's a longer term thing, there's normally a route to do that and generally it would just be a conversation in the first place to figure out what's the best of those routes to go down great and we'll make sure to post all the links up to the the sites as well when we post this so okay. thank you so much for the the conversation today yeah thank you very much for having me on i've joined the ranks of the the other greats that have already been so far on the series <laughs>